Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1, beginning in verse 29. Hear now the word of the Lord. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Well, my favorite story of this year is Nathan Apodaca. Do you know this name? Probably not. He's a guy from Idaho. And he posted a video on TikTok and it went viral over social media. He's riding a skateboard drinking ocean spray, and he's lip-syncing to this Fleetwood Mac song. It's ridiculous. But this became a phenomenon about a month ago or so. Ocean Spray saw it, and they donated to this guy a brand-new pickup truck filled with cranberry juice just because of this video. So in our culture, it's easier than ever to become famous. This guy went from nobody to a sensation overnight. You post something online, it gets shared over and over. Everybody knows about it. Usually the fame is short-lived, of course. Most of these people in these viral stories remain in the public eye for a few days. Then the next one comes along and we forget about the previous one. The ancient world was much different, though. Most people barely knew anyone outside of their hometowns. It was much more difficult to become famous because then it really depended upon word of mouth. And that takes effort. It's one thing to share a video by clicking your mouse. It's another thing to actually burn calories and go tell someone else about what you saw, something that they should know. You're not really going to do that unless you think it's absolutely important. John the Baptist becomes famous in Mark chapter 1, verse 5. All of Judea, all Jerusalem goes out to him. But his fame was kind of a slow burn. He's probably preaching and baptizing for weeks or even months before he became this phenomenon in Israel. Jesus literally becomes an overnight sensation with his teaching in the synagogue and his casting out of the demon that we saw last week. And then in verse 28 of Mark chapter 1, at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So now we look at the second part of that 24-hour period that turns the world upside down. In verses 29 through 39 of Mark chapter 1, we see Christ, the conquering king, continues his campaign of liberating his people and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. First, we see a private miracle. Second, we see public miracles. And finally, a preaching mission. So first, a private miracle. Now, Mark doesn't give us a lot of detail, as we've seen. He's not a verbose writer. He gives us what we need to know and nothing else. And so we don't know exactly what happens at the synagogue after Jesus teaches with such amazing authority. Then he casts out the demon from this man who comes in. It must have been pandemonium, chaos in the synagogue. What just happened? Who is this man who speaks this way, who does these things? Where does he get this power? 
People are probably running out of the synagogue to tell others of what they just saw. Now remember, Capernaum is basically a fishing village. There's not a whole lot going on day to day in Capernaum. It's not that exciting of a place to be. And then Jesus comes on, and it's instant hysteria. What is happening in this village? Now, our culture, especially this year, is desensitized to drama. I don't know about you. I've become kind of numb to it. You turn on the news, and it's just one thing after another. Fires, protests, and I think, well, when it gets close to me, I'll pay more attention. But we can't. We're just not wired to address these catastrophes, every single one around the world. But it wasn't that way in the ancient world. Life was terribly ordinary. You didn't have a lot of excitement in your day-to-day life. And so when something extraordinary would happen, everyone gets caught up in it. Verse 29, immediately he left the synagogue, entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now again, we don't know the details. Mark doesn't tell us. It's possible that Jesus and the disciples just leisurely strolled out of the synagogue They walked down the street, went to Peter's and Andrew's house to have dinner. It's also possible that they had to push their way out of the synagogue because it was chaos. This frenzied crowd running down the street, beetle mania happening in Capernaum. And so they duck into Peter's house to escape. In 1968, archaeologists in Capernaum discovered what they think is Peter's house. And it is quite close to the synagogue. So whether it was a leisurely walk or rather a swift run, eventually Jesus and his disciples end up at Peter's house. And then we see the shortest healing account in the Gospel of Mark, verse 30. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Now, we know that the disciples didn't take Jesus into the house specifically for the purpose of healing Peter's mother-in-law because they tell him about her after he arrives. So he wasn't brought there for this healing. They probably walked in. Jesus sees her lying there, and so they tell him her condition. Now, at this point, at least in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples haven't seen Jesus heal anybody. They've just witnessed the exorcism, but that's it. They don't really know what he's capable of. Now, the ancient world saw fever itself as an illness. It wasn't merely a symptom of another illness. So we don't know exactly what caused the fever. In the parallel account in Luke chapter 4, Luke calls it a high fever or a great fever. So whatever the cause of this fever was, it wasn't a normal fever. She might have been close to death because of this fever. And she's lying ill or she's lying low with this fever. Jesus approaches her. He takes her hand and he lifts her up. She is down. She's lying low. Immediately she's raised. Now, taking her hand and lifting her up happens at the same time. This is not a slow process. He doesn't take her hand and then wait a few moments, talk a little bit. Slowly she gets up. No, it's instant. He takes her hand, lifts her up. The fever's gone immediately. Now, of course, Jesus probably did speak to her, but Mark doesn't tell us that he did. The healing comes with a touch. We see Christ heal with a touch throughout Mark's gospel. It displays the close connection that Jesus has with those he heals. He's not a king locked away in a tower. He's not behind a wall away from those who can approach him. He's in amongst his people, touching them. And the proof that she is healed instantly comes at the end of verse 31. She began to serve them. Now, typically, recovery from a fever is slow. It's incremental. Slowly, you get better and better. Not with Peter's mother-in-law. Immediate, she gets up. She's up and about. She's probably making dinner for them, as any good Mediterranean mother would. In a case like this, you bring your friends over. Of course, she's going to get up and make a meal. 
So the disciples have now heard Jesus teach in the synagogue, this new teaching with authority. They've seen Christ cast out a demon and now heal a woman with a fever. And they have to be thinking that Jesus is the Messiah at this point, that he is the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. But we'll see throughout the Gospel of Mark that the disciples truly don't understand who Jesus is. They're trying to understand him. Is he Messiah? Is he really the king? But over and over again, they just don't get it until finally their eyes are opened as to who Jesus truly is. So that's the private miracle. Now we see the public miracles. Now we don't know at what time Jesus and his disciples arrive at Peter's house. But at sundown, business picks up, verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Why wait till sundown? It's the Sabbath. They wanted to wait for the Sabbath to end. And the question is, is it lawful for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath? This comes up in Mark chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue. A man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now, it's doubtful that the crowds wait until sundown because they were concerned about Jesus violating the Sabbath. More likely, they were afraid that they would be violating the Sabbath if they bring those who are demon-oppressed to Jesus before the Sabbath ends. There's an entire system of Sabbath practices that develop on top of God's revelation in Scripture. So they start with God's word, passages like Jeremiah 17, verses 21-22. Thus says the Lord, take care for the sake of your lives. Do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your fathers. Okay, that's clear to us. No burdens on the Sabbath day. Don't carry a burden. But is caring for the sick a burden? Can you give medicine on the Sabbath day? Then all the rabbis jump in with their interpretations. So in the Mishnah, which is an early collection of rabbinical writings, it says, if a person has a sore throat, it is permitted to put drugs into his throat on the Sabbath because the disease may endanger his life. Whatsoever threatens to endanger life supersedes the Sabbath. So that makes sense. You don't just let someone die because it's the Sabbath. If a guy falls off his roof, you're not just going to lay there and look at him and not help him because it's the Sabbath day. You're going to try to save his life. But what if it's not life-threatening? What do we do then? The Damascus document, it's one of the scrolls found at Qumran, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It states that no one minding an infant shall carry it from one place to another on the Sabbath. So you're not going to grandma's house on the Sabbath. So all of these extra biblical practices get added to scripture over time. And, it, and these practices themselves become a burden that the people have to carry on the Sabbath. They're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. But Jesus is not afraid to heal on the Sabbath. He says in Mark chapter 2, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the crowd waits till the end of the day, and then it's a rush. A constant stream of people show up, continuously bringing to him those who need the Messiah to rescue them from this oppression. One after another after another, they bring him the sick and the demon oppressed. Now Mark distinguishes those, between those who need to be healed from natural ailments, this is the sickness, those who were sick with various diseases, and those who needed relief from supernatural forces, demonic oppression. Jesus controls both of these realms, the natural realm and the supernatural realm. And he 
demonstrates it with the individual cases at the synagogue and at Peter's house. He casts out a demon at the synagogue. He heals Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Power over supernatural and natural realms. And then in verse 33, the whole city was gathered together at the door. Obviously, this is hyperbole from Mark. Mark likes to talk this way. He does the same thing in verse 5 with John the Baptist. All the country of Judea, all Jerusalem were coming out. It's not every single one, but it's a whole lot of people. It seemed as if everybody in the entire town is at the door. The crowd just keeps growing. His fame is spreading throughout the whole city. A miracle worker has come to Capernaum. Come and see. Verse 34, he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. Now, Mark says that he healed many, he cast out many demons. Now, we shouldn't take this to mean that he healed many, but not all. That he cast out many of the demons, but not all. No, the point is that everyone who was present there received healing. Everyone who was present had a demon cast out. And those were many people. Many people showed up. And Jesus healed them. And this must have gone on for a long time. Mark doesn't name the various diseases that Jesus healed. We've already seen him heal a fever. Later, he'll, he will heal leprosy, paralysis, chapter 2, hemorrhaging, deafness, blindness. Jesus is not a specialist in healing. He doesn't just heal one type of illness. He heals all of them. He's a general practitioner. Bring him anything, and he will heal it. So we see the private miracle, we see the public miracles, and now we see his preaching mission, verse 35. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Remember, everything that took place between verse 21 and verse 34 was a single day. Remember this next time you think that you're busy. <laughs> you wouldn't believe all the stuff that I have to do today. Imagine having Jesus' calendar. One day. And it's hard on him. He's human. He is a man just as much as we are. And so he needs to get away. He needs a break. We all have those times when we want just a few minutes away from the noise. Imagine having an entire city literally beating down your door to get to you. And so he retreats to pray some time alone. Mark only records three occasions of Jesus getting away to spend time in prayer. Here, amidst all the hysteria in Capernaum early in his ministry, then in Mark 6, after he feeds the 5,000, he goes up to a mountain to pray. And finally, in Mark 14, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before the crucifixion. So at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end of his ministry, he takes time to pray, clearing his mind of the commotion of this world, spending time with the Father. Now, if Jesus needs to take time to do that, how much more do we need? And he goes away to a desolate place. This is the same word that's used for wilderness in verses 3 and 4. Also, verse 12, he goes into the wilderness to pray. The king has begun the process of taming the wilderness, making it fit for his kingdom. He's transforming a place that is formless and void into a sacred space. And it becomes a holy place because Christ is there. He's communing with his Father. Of course, the Spirit is there as well. Christ is anointed by the Spirit. So we see the triune God fellowshipping in this dark, desolate place that is being made holy. Verse 36, Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Everyone wakes up. Jesus isn't there. They start to panic. What happened? Where'd he go? Mark points out that Simon 
and those who were with him went looking. Of course, Mark is getting the story from Peter. So it's understandable that Mark would single him out. But I think this also indicates that early on, Peter's in a leadership position amongst the disciples. He's leading the search for Jesus. And his position as leader of the disciples will become more apparent as Jesus' ministry goes on. And then in verse 37, they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Why are they looking for him? They want to worship him as Messiah? Or are they just looking for the next miracle? More likely, it's the latter. They want the show. They want to see what he's going to do next. What new authoritative teaching is he going to deliver? Acts chapter 17, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They want new teaching, new miracles. What miracle is going to come next? What will the next exorcism be like? They want the spectacle. They don't want the Messiah. Some, no doubt, were hoping that he would ride into Jerusalem, overthrow the Romans, set up the Davidic kingdom. If the kingdom of heaven is at hand, as you say it is, let's see it. Of course, they would be hoping for a prominent place in that kingdom. Even some of the disciples want that. The crowds want a prominent place. The disciples want a prominent place. But that's not what Jesus wants. He does everything he can to mitigate the hysteria of the crowds. And that's why he doesn't allow the demons to speak in verse 34. He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. As we saw with the demon in the synagogue, Jesus silences these demons lest they become associated with him. But also he can't have the demons identifying him as Messiah and stirring up this crowd. Now, some scholars call this Mark's messianic secret. Why is Jesus so concerned about silencing people? We see him silence demons, chapter 1, chapter 3. He silences people that he heals, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8. He silences the disciples in chapters 8 and 9 after the transfiguration. They get a foretaste of the consummate kingdom of God, and he tells them to be quiet. Why would he do this? Well, he has to do this because he can't jeopardize his mission of going to the cross. If he openly proclaims he's the Messiah, the king of the Jews, the son of God, the crowds will lose their minds. This is what they do, John 6. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is what they want. They want a Davidic king on the throne. And they'll do everything they can, even trying to force him to take the crown. And we know that the Jewish leaders and that the Roman leaders are not okay with this. They're not just going to let him be crowned king. So when they get their chance, they kill him. But Jesus has to orchestrate everything so that he dies when he wants to die at the time appointed by the Father. It can't happen earlier than that time just because the crowds in a frenzy attracted the attention of the Romans. He lays down his life at the exact time of his choosing. It is not taken from him. And that time comes after he enters Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11. At that point, there is no messianic secret. He openly proclaims himself Messiah in word and deed. There's no mystery after he enters into Jerusalem. But then in verse 38, he says, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. Jesus knows what the crowd wants, but he also knows what they need. They need the preaching of the gospel. This is the focus of his ministry on the way to the cross. And he says, this is why I came out. This word appears often in this passage. Verse 25, he commands the demon to come out. Verse 26, the demon comes out. 28, his, Fred's, his fame spread, same word. His fame came out. Verse 29, they come out of the synagogue. Verse 35, he comes out to a desolate place to pray. But verse 38 is different. 
This is almost a technical term. It's closer to verse 7 of chapter 1 when John says, After me comes one who is mightier than I. It's a closely connected word to verse 38. Basically, Jesus is saying in verse 38, This is why I made my appearing, my first coming. This is why I came in the incarnation. That's what he's referencing. The incarnation itself. He's not talking about coming out away from the crowds into the wilderness. He's talking about coming to the earth. That's why I'm here, to preach. He came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and to die on behalf of sinners. That's the point of the incarnation. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came... Not to call the righteous, but sinners. Mark chapter 10, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ didn't come to put on a show. He came to preach and to die. And the preaching was to explain the dying. If we don't have the preaching, we don't understand the point of the dying. If we don't have the dying, the preaching is empty. There's no point. But we have both. We have the preaching and the dying. What a day he had. Preaching, casting out demons, healing Peter's mother-in-law, many others, casting out more demons. What a day. And this day of Christ is a foretaste of the kingdom of God in its fullness and the eternal Sabbath rest when Christ's enemies will be vanquished forever along with sickness and disease and all the effects of sin. We now receive a foretaste of that kingdom in its fullness when we partake of the Lord's Supper. The spirit of the age to come enables us to feed on the body and blood of Christ that was crucified for us. And as we experience this foretaste, we long for the day when we will see Christ face to face and we will forever sit down to eat and drink with the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we praise you for your revelation that you give to us in your word. We pray now that you would not make us mere hearers of the word, but doers also, that you would use the preaching of the gospel to strengthen and nourish our faith, to transform us more and more into the image of your Son, in whose name we pray, amen.